Welcome everyone to the ninth episode in the series. Um, thank you for everyone who's been part of this over the last two months. It's hard to believe we're at episode nine. Um, excited today for the first time we've got one of our one of our speakers and panelists is coming all the way from across the pond. I partnered with Rosaria Cirillo Lauman for the Yellow Goldfish. Want to have a say a quick hello, Rosaria? Good afternoon, good morning, and buongiorno from the Netherlands. <laughs> from the Netherlands, but you might detect a little bit of an Italian accident, accent there. Um, excited to share uh, episode nine, which is all about how to leverage happiness to drive both productivity and prosperity in business. And this is all part of what we're calling ECPC, Employees and Customers Post-Corona, and we're saying back to black. How do we adjust to this new normal? And the ECPC is a def, you know, a shout out to this iconic rock band that started in the 1970s, and that's ACDC. And just seven years after they started, the band had this tragic event that happened to them. They lost their, their lead singer, uh, Bon Scott. And they, because of that crisis and tragedy, they couldn't see a way to move forward. Uh, but their friends, their, their relatives told the band, you need to push on in Bond's memory. And so just a month after he passed, tragically passed in 1980, the band ended up hiring a new lead singer, Brian Johnson. And just a one week after they, they hired Brian, they flew the band to the Bahamas and they began work on the next ACDC album. And they made a conscious choice not to use any of the material that had been created by Bond. And so over seven weeks, they had to learn how to work together, adjust to a new normal. And as a result of that, they launched the iconic album, Back in Black. And Back in Black was in black in memory of Bon Scott. And that album produced over those seven weeks ended up becoming one of the best selling albums of all time. In fact, some lists have it the second best selling album of all time with 50 million albums sold since it launched in 1980. Again, today is the ninth episode. It's all about happiness. It's wrapped up in this package that Rosari and I call the yellow goldfish. And so I wanted to share a, a brief story before we get into why yellow and why a goldfish. And to do so, I have to take you back over a decade ago and tell you the story of this guy right here. This is Doug Dietz. And so Doug worked for GE Healthcare. And a little over a decade ago, Doug had been part of a team that created a new MRI machine for GE. In fact, to use in especially children's hospitals specifically designed for kids. And so right when it was launching, he was so excited, he went out to a hospital to see it uh, to see this new, this new MRI machine working in effect. And as he was walking down the hallway in the hospital, he saw a young girl who was, just looked in terror and was crying. And she was just about to do uh, her MRI. And it was a moment that really kind of shook Doug to the core. Um, here he had spent all of this time on this new technology, he was excited about it, and he realized that while the product may be amazing, the experience was really falling short. And it caused him to go on a journey to really think more from a design thinking perspective and to rethink this into an entire experience 
And so he started what's called the Adventure Series from GE. And in a, norma, a, a number of different scenes created this idea of creating an experience. This one that you see right here is uh, Pirate Island. But the idea is even before that child got into the room, this story and experience was taking place. And what was amazing is this is another example of it up close. In order, in order of thinking beyond the product to more of the experience, he was able to solve a major problem. And he went from having a majority of the kids having to get sedated before they went into the MRI to now having kids that were excited and thrilled about the possibility of going into an MRI. In fact, one of his favorite stories he shares was he overheard a boy tell his mother after going through this experience, he said, hey, can we come back tomorrow and do that again? And so what we love about this idea that it's really thought about creating an experience that's better for the customer. It makes the customer happier. But think about the employees that had to, to deal with the children before. It certainly creates a better and a more happier experience for the employees at the hospital. And then because it was such a great experience, the time to be able to do the MRIs was shortened dramatically. And because the kids were part of the experience and they stayed still, the results were better and they didn't have to redo the MRIs. So essentially it was happier for society as well. And it's, it's our belief that this idea of happiness should probably be the most important metric we think about in business. And why is that? Is because it makes absolute business sense. And so let's look on the, the customer side of the equation. If you can create happy customers, well, they're willing to pay a premium for your, your product or service. And because they're happy, they're more likely to repeat as customers and come back more often. Now, how about on the other side of the equation, creating a happier experience? If you can create an experience for your employees that's happy, that also pays major dividends. You're gonna turn over less, they're gonna be more productive, they're gonna be more profitable. Um, so the whole concept of this idea of a yellow goldfish is how do you do the little things for your customers to make them happier, your employees to make them happier, but ultimately to do things for society to create a better. Now we call them a yellow goldfish. Rosari and I have now collected over 300 examples of companies that do these little things. But really quickly, why a goldfish and why yellow? So why the goldfish? The goldfish relates to my very own first pet. Um, this is me when I was six years old. If you can see all the hair that I used to have, um, I, I long for these days of, of being able to see that hair. But my very first pet was a goldfish. In fact, uh, when I was six, I went to a carnival and I threw the ping pong ball and I won my very first goldfish. Now what's interesting about goldfish on average, they, only, they don't grow to be too big on average. In fact, the average goldfish is just the size of your thumb and the average person's thumb is just three inches. Now that, that's average. And if you've been on these webinars before, you, you may be have an idea of what the world's largest goldfish is, but throw it out there if you, if you wanna take a guess in the chat. What do you think in inches, and we've got Rosaria, you can do centimeters as well, but in inches, what's the world's largest goldfish? 
And, and right here, you're looking at a picture of the world's largest goldfish right here. Um, and I spoke a couple of years ago for the Guinness, Guinness folks, and I can verify this. It is nearly 20 inches or 50 centimeters. And so to put that in perspective, if that's average, 20 inches is the size of an average domesticated house cat or 50 centimeters. So like, how is that even possible to have some that are just average and some that grow to be five to six times the size? It would be like walking out of your, your house or your apartment this morning and bumping into somebody who's literally three stories tall. Well, it turns out for a goldfish that their growth is impacted by five things. And here's the thing, those same five things impact everyone that's on this webinar today. And the first one most people know, their growth is impacted by what? The size of the bowl or the pond that they're in. So the bigger the, the bowl or the bigger the pond, the more the goldfish will typically grow. And in business, that's the market for your product or service. Their growth is also impacted by the other goldfish in that bowl or the pond. Who are those other goldfish? Simply your competition. The third thing, and, and it's so apt to where we are right now, their growth is also impacted by the quality of the water that the goldfish is in. So the nutrients, the cloudiness, so the more nutrients, the less cloudiness, the more they grow. In business, that surrounding environment is simply the economy, right? So the better the economy, the easier it is to grow. How a goldfish does in their first four months of life will also determine how big they can get. They're tiny when they're born. What's that in business? That's simply when you're a startup, or when you launch a new product or service, how it does in those first four months. Here's number five, it's genetic makeup. So for a goldfish, what are they born with that separates them from all of the other goldfish? And the stronger their genes are, um, and the more that they're separated, the better they typically do. What is that in business? It's simply this, it's differentiation. How do you stand out in what Rosari and I would call a sea of sameness? Now here's the challenge, there's five factors here. Which one do you actually have control over? And here's the challenge, if you've already been in business for more than four months, you've gotta throw number four out do you have control over the, the market, your competition, or the economy? No, no, and no, right? The only thing you have control over is how you differentiate what you do, and more importantly, how you do it. And we would say also why you do it. And happiness is a big part of that. Now, if the goldfish is a metaphor for growth and differentiation, why yellow? Well, yellow was the seventh color in the series. The original three colors were an ode to this place right here. That place is New Orleans because purple, green, and gold were the three colors of Mardi Gras. And the reason why it's an ode to New Orleans is that there's one word that comes from New Orleans that exemplifies this idea of doing a little bit more and it's a word that Mark Twain said was tra worth traveling all the way to New Orleans to get. That one word is called lanyap. And lanyap is the idea of doing a little something extra. Uh, it's Creole, so it's French and Spanish. It literally means the additional gift or to give more, to go beyond the transaction. Now, why yellow for yellow goldfish? Well, Rosario will share a little bit. You know, yellow is the, the color of warmth. And so we think about the sun. 
and warmth. Um, it's also a primary color. And, but the reason I like the most is when you think about the color yellow, it's hard not, to, and think about happiness, it's hard not to think about the yellow smiley face. And a little bit of a fun backstory back in the, the 1960s, there was a designer named Harvey Ball. And he lived in Massachusetts and he ended up doing a project for uh, the, the State Mutual Life Insurance Company. And they were struggling with employee engagement. And so they hired him to be able to create a design for this program. And this is a picture of Harvey Ball. They paid him $45 back then. It took him just 10 minutes and he created the iconic uh, happy face. Um, now, so that's a little bit of the background of, of why yellow. And yellow is just an ode to happiness, how we feel that happiness is critical in terms of your growth and differentiation. Um, and with that, I wanna throw it over to Rosaria. Rosaria is gonna tell us a little bit of background on happiness, really what influences our happiness and tee up five of the types that we're gonna talk about today. Rosaria? Thanks, Stan. So Rosaria here from, from the Netherlands. I'm the co-author of Yellow Goldfish with, uh, together with Stan, which re recently also just went live in Italian as well. And extremely quickly, background uh, about, by myself, I moved to the Netherlands 18 years ago, and I've been working for a number of corporate companies uh, for the first 13 years. And six years ago, I started Wow Now with the belief that happiness should be at the center because if we increase happiness, we also increase profitability. And ever since I've been giving advising uh, and master classes on this topic. So why happiness? One of my favorite metaphor is the one from Tal Ben Shahar, which uh, um, equiparates happiness to the sun. We mentioned yellow and the color of warmth. There is also one more reason, and that is because we cannot look straight into the sun, um, otherwise we would get blind. So what Tal Ben Shahar says is the same applies to happiness. We cannot pursue happiness directly because if we do so, then um, we are gonna be actually uh, most unhappy and most depressed because we will never reach it. So how can we really be happy? We need to pursue uh, items and area and elements which indirectly influence our happiness. And that is why with Stan we looked at what does then influence our happiness and how can companies contribute to it. There are three main factors that influence our happiness. The first element, if you imagine, for example, going on a beautiful beach with the sun, the first elements that uh, um, generates happiness are our four, five senses, because we perceive the world through our five senses. So as you are on a beach, you see the vastness of the sea, the beautiful colors of the sunset, you hear the crash of the waves along the shore, you start smelling the fresh air and even the salt you can smell, you can definitely taste it on your lips and you can feel the sand under your feet or you can touch it with your hands. And by having this physical contact through your five senses, what also happens is that in your body, the biology of your body is so that a number of happy chemicals get released, specifically the dose of happiness, which is constituted by dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphin. You get dopamine because it's exciting to be on the beach. Very often you're gonna do some activity on the beach and because you are meeting your needs, as you will see in a moment. You get oxytocin because of, of the touch with the sand, with other people. You get serotonin because you also have the, uh, the ray of the sun and the light. And you get endorphin because you smile. And actually smiling, it's the biggest. Uh, we also say that happiness is just what we have under our nose. We can always smile. And while we have been in years of study about how much our mind can influence our body, it's also through the opposite. Our body can influence our mind. So by smiling, we can even turn a bad mood into happiness. 
And dopamine, we said, also gets triggered when we meet our needs, especially when we do so in new ways. Why? Because there is a very strong link between emotions and needs. And specifically, if we look at the emotion that all the human beings feel, it boils down to five emotions, which very, very often and too often, unfortunately, get labeled as positive or negative, as opposed to pleasant and unpleasant. But by calling it negative, we are almost saying that we don't want to feel sad, fear, or anger because otherwise we are not happy. But the emotions only have the um, objective of setting us in motion in order to meet our needs. And therefore, a big part of happiness is to really embrace and accept all of the emotion. A better way to distinguish between emotions is emotions which we feel when our needs are met and emotion that we feel when our needs are not met. So that in this way, we can identify what are our needs, the needs of our customers, the needs of our employees, and how we also as companies can actually fulfill and exceed those needs. So what are then the needs? We are all familiar with the Maslow hierarchy of needs, and there is a clear correlation between the level of needs that we meet and the emotions that we feel, and if we also look at the score that the customer give us in satisfaction survey or in a net promoter score, there is a correlation with that as well. But most of all, there are universal human needs across nine categories, which as we also work on yellow goldfish, we really identify that they matched each and every single letter of the word happiness. Um, and those are universal human needs that we all have. And this also split is based on the findings of Marshall Rosenberg from Nonviolent Communication. As we went through our projects of analyzing over 300 cases um, in the Yellow Goldfish project, we really identified clearly those nine elements that constitute happiness, the word happiness, the economy of happiness, and that companies can leverage in order to contribute to happiness for the customers and for the employees. Uh, so the first one is about health. So making sure that the employees, the customers are supported both from a physical and mental point of view. The next one is autonomy, which is about enabling them, providing tools um, and situations for them to operate freely. Purpose is about giving a feeling of meaning and that they matter and that they make a difference into the world. Play is about letting go and really um, uh, enable our creativity and really let the child in us um, have his way. Uh, integrity, it's really about honesty and transparency and feeling safe into the environment that surrounds us. Uh, then you have nature, which is about beauty and harmony, as well as literally about spending time in nature. Empathy is all about belonging and connection and really making difference into people's life. Simplicity is about reducing also the mental and the physical energy, because when things get complex, also in terms of biology, instead of producing the dose of happiness, we actually produce cortisol and stress. And finally, smile, which is about being grateful and celebrate, and sometimes it's also about accepting losses and mourn those losses. So what we did in Yellow Goldfish, we looked at all the companies which are um, doing the little extra under each of those categories, and we um, identified over 300, and we cover about 50 in the book itself. Um, and today, instead of going through all the nine, we will focus on five. So without any further ado, I give the word to you, Stan, for the first three. <laughs> Thank you, Rosaria. Uh, so I'm going to cover the first three. And what I want to start with, number one, is autonomy. And as Rosaria shared, it's really the ability to empower, especially your team members, um, to give them greater control over the experience that you provide. And one of the examples that we talk about uh, in the book comes from the Ritz-Carlton. And the Ritz-Carlton is, 
is obsessively focused on providing a great experience for their guests. And one of the ways that they do that is that they empower their staff and team members to be able to do the little things to deliver that, that great experience. And so they're famous for having what's called the, the $2,000 rule. And how it works is that anyone from the janitor all the way up to the GM of a property has at their disposal up to $2,000 that they can use to satisfy the needs of any guest. And they have up to $2,000 uh, before they have to ask for any type of permission to, to do something for a guest. And that, that seems like a lot of money when, when you step back and realize that the, the average lifetime value of a Ritz-Carlton guest is north of $250,000 over their lifetime, enabling one of your employees to, to take less than 1% of that to be able to try to fulfill their needs. Um, a great example of, of really opening the door to empowering your employees to provide that great experience. The second type we're gonna cover today is what's called play. Um, and we can remember as kids how important play was in terms of our overall happiness. And it's the ability to, to have fun, especially on the employee side of the equation, when you're creating that experience for, for your customers. And a fun example we share is a New York City agency that's called Peppercom. And Peppercom was headed by a guy by the name of Steve Cody. You can, let me go back here. You can see Steve Cody over here to the right. Um, so Steve Cody had what many would call like a midlife crisis. And instead of buying a red sports car, Steve decided that he was going to try his hand at becoming a stand-up comedian. And so he hired a coach and he started taking lessons on stand-up comedy, didn't tell anyone on the team at Peppercom. And over the course of the next six to nine months, the agency started to win more and more business. And they recognized the ability for Steve being really good in the room, especially when they were pitching um, a new client or even upselling and selling in new business to existing clients. And so the other members of the senior team called him out on it and he admitted to taking these, to doing this comedy training. Well, next thing you know, everybody on the senior team of the organization started comedy training. And they liked it so much and um, it turned out that all of the account directors and the account supervisors then were put through comedy training. And now today, if, even if you're an intern at Peppercom, one of the things that you do as part of your onboarding is that you do comedy training, of which graduation is five minutes of stand-up in order to be able to graduate. Um, now, when I first wrote about Peppercom, that same year they were recognized by um, one of the prominent business publications in New York City of being the number one best place to work. And they do a, a number of things to drive the happiness for their employees and for their customers. But I love the idea of the comedy training is, is engaging in that level of play to be able to create a better experience. They believe in it so much, now they train their clients in improv and comedy training as part of their, their services. The third one we're going to talk about today is the idea of simplicity. 
And this is trying to remove as much as you can of complexity out of the experience, especially on the customer side of the equation, but also making it easier for your employees. And Siegel and Gale did a great study on the impact of simplicity. And it's just not a feel good thing, it actually makes great business sense. So it turns out if you can create a much more convenient and simple experience, that your customers will pay a premium for that. And that if the experience that they, ex that they have is simple, they're also more likely to be not only loyal and come back, but to go out of their way um, and recommend your product or service to others. And so each year Siegel and Gale does a, a survey. And in the year we were writing the book, Netflix was the simplest from a user interface and simplest experience and they, uh, they topped the list. To be able to talk about uh, integrity and smile, I'm gonna throw it back to you, Rosaria. Thank you, Stan. So for the integrity, we choose an example which comes from the, originally from the Netherlands, but they're now actually also all over the US. Uh, since three years, they're now uh, also selling in US and they've expanded all over Europe. And it's Tony's Chocoloni. And the story behind this one was that the, uh, the journalist Turn, which is the original Dutch name of, of Tony, um, was doing a study over, over uh, South Africa, and as he went in the um, uh, Costa Vore and Golf, Guinea, Guinea Golf, he discovered that actually there is not only still a lot of slavery, but there is children slavery. So there were actually children which were being taken away from their family by the age of five, six years old, as soon as they had hands and arms to uh, really work into the uh, cacao fields and they were only sent back to their family once they were 18 years old or they become big enough to defend themselves uh, without having learned to read or to write or have received any education. So they had been um, ripped away, not only of their childhood, but also of their future. As Ton was shocked that this was being done in such an illegal way, he eat up 12 bars of chocolates and then he went to the police and said, please arrest me because I've eaten illegally produced chocolate. Of course, he did not get arrested, but that was for him, became the trigger to change the world the way that he could do. And that's when he started Tony's Chocoloni with the purpose of creating a chocolate which was 100% slave free not only for Tony's Chocoloni, but eventually over the past 10 years, also overall in the world. And over the last couple of years, they've really been able also to make agreements together with big uh, chains in the Netherlands and in Belgium, convincing them as well to start producing 100% slave-free chocolate by using processes developed by them to really track what they call the entire process from bean to bar. Uh, their yellow goldfish that we picked under the uh, integrity part, it's uh, uh, Chocolonis Foundation. They give 1% of their revenue uh, yearly to good causes and to make sure that all the, the children which still need to work in those plantations, they also receive proper education, so they actually learn to read and to write, that all the farmers receive proper, uh, pro, um, uh, proper education and also proper treatment but they also have yellow goldfish all over every possible category. They also, for example, are very strong on awareness and empathy. And you see here an example of their bar, which is probably the only bar in the world which does not have equal uh, squares and piece of chocolate, but it's disequal to make everyone aware of disequality. And actually what you see in the bar are the countries in the, um, Costa War and in the Guinea Gulf, where the main cacao productions are. Uh, but they also do plenty of other things. So here I have a quick few examples. They do a monthly Tony Talks, 
in which one of their management presents for 20 minutes, half an hour to 25 to 30 people every month for a different topic. Here they were sharing the story of Tone and uh, really showing how the children work and study in the plantation. Um, as you visit their office as a, as a um, visitor, you also see that even their toilets are just no normal toilets, but they are uh, wallpapered, if that's an English word, um, with the photos of cacao plantation. So when you enter their toilets, you're actually going into the a cacao plantation. Uh, even before Corona, this was already a year ago, they had very funny poster with the tips on how not to get sick. And if you do get the flu, how not to pass it on to your colleagues. Uh, and then they have incredibly funny things like the bureau bingo. So like on a monthly basis, they do a bingo which decides where you're gonna sit. So that you will always sit with different type of uh, colleagues and create culture. Uh, if you're a Tony, you stay a Tony for life. So they also send you a package once you leave Tony with all things that you can still do as an ex-employee. And this is one of the funniest. If you do get a child, you get a special teeny Tony package, which also includes a baby suit for, uh, for your child. You get an extra 1,000 euro bonus to get all the things that you need for your child. And if you name your child Tony, you actually get an extra 1,000 euro. So you can guess what is the name of the children of all the employees at, the, at Tony's Chocoloni. Uh, and they have one more related to the COVID situation. When um, on the 11th of uh, March, everything shut down and went to lockdown into the Netherlands, they sent to all of their employees a Quarantoni survival kit with all the things that the employee could possibly need from the soap to wash their hands to toilet paper, the good roll, which is also like a special uh, recyclable force for good type of toilet paper. Of course, some Tony Chocoloni, a book, socks, and a Corona, the beer, not the virus. Uh, and also in the book, we joke that the, when you unwrap their chocolate, it gives a feeling of Willy Wonka type of uh, chocolate looking for the golden ticket to visit uh, um, the, the factory. With Tony Chocoloni, you don't need to win to find the gold ticket because they are actually building, and this I think is a surprise for you, Stan, I don't think you know about this. They're actually building a Willy Wonka style factory here in Zandam, just above uh, Amsterdam, where you can actually gonna be able to go on a roller coaster, visiting their production uh, fabric and, and their entire uh, uh, um, corporate head office. So they would definitely break us also on play uh, and they definitely make us smile, which is the last S of happiness and also the last of the example that we present, we share today. So for Smile, uh, we also have instead lead examples from a company called Qualtrics. Qualtrics is one of the leaders on the market providing software to survey your customers or to do market research. Their yellow goldfish uh, it's called Dream Experiences, and it's a bonus that they give to their employees of $1,500 or euro per year on a use it or lose it base that employees have to use for a dream experience, something which is out of their bucket list that they always wanted to do, but they have not done yet. So people so far have used it to go visiting China and go over the big wall. They've used it to go swimming with the, uh, um, uh, with the fish, they've used it for all sorts of things and also for good causes. And when it comes to customers, what do they do then? When it comes for, uh, to customers, they do something called the CX4 or the Experience Management Summit, which has been, this year was at its fourth year, and it has been always having an amazing lineup with Barack Obama, with opera, with all sorts of uh, uh, rock bands. And this year was going to have uh, Michelle Obama, Brene Brown, Ellie DeGeneres, Ariana Huffington was like the place to be from the 10th to the 13th of March and the killers in concert. And if you think about those dates, what I found that was extremely remarkable was that by the mid of February, when nobody, at least in US, was still considering Corona a big issue, they decided to put first 
the health, the safety, and also the um, information, the security of their customers and say, despite all we have put up to get in this, we are gonna postpone it. And, and now it seems unimaginable that they would have done anything different, but I can tell you that I was supposed to fly to US on the 12th of March for a conference, another conference between the 13th and the 15th of March. And up until the 8th, they were still saying, we have no coronavirus in Florida, we have no coronavirus in US. Of course, we're gonna go ahead with the conference. So you can really see the difference of companies which are really centered and putting the safety of their employees at the center of what they do. And uh, the last thing also from Qualtrics, which we also mentioned in the book, it's they also give back to society with something that it's called Five for the Fight. So they started this um, campaign, this movement of giving five euro or five dollars for somebody in your family which you have lost or it's fighting cancer. Uh, and they are doing it themselves as well in every possible way. They give 100% of the donation gets given to the research being done in experimental way on the elephants, which are apparently the only animal which doesn't get cancer. So that's for SMILE. And at this point, Stan, I'll give it back to you. I don't know if you want to give such the questions or... Um, yeah, awesome. Right. So thank you, Rosari. We're, we're going to tee up uh, questions and comments and I've already seen that thank you Mark for we've got a couple already in the queue which is great um, and we're going to address his first one in a second which is all about the smile one but I wanted to share one last story and it's about a company called La Rosa's and this is a, a pizza chain in the Midwest shout out to Dennis Devlin because a couple of years ago, I got a chance to speak at the Ignite CX conference and share the yellow goldfish. But one of the other speakers at that conference, and it just tickled me to no end, was La Rosa's. And they're all about trying to make sure that people smile. In fact, they think it's the only thing that they actually want to be able to measure and report. So... Did they make you smile? And I love this. You can, today you can go to their site and it has this sliding bar that you can be able to give them feedback on how happy you were with the experience that you had with La Rosa's. Um, so wanted to share that example because I think that's, again, we talk about happiness as maybe the single most important metric for your customers your employees and what you do for society. Um, so I wanted to share a company that really brings that home and actually is measuring that. Let's do this though, let's open it up for questions and comments. And I'm gonna start off with Mark, Mark Villalobos who says, understanding that smiling is so important to our happiness, do you have any suggestions how to effectively express happiness and friendliness to our customers through, if we're being responsible, through our masks. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe take a stab at that, and then Rosario, I'll throw it, I'll ask you to go off a of mute and share your thoughts. I think one of the, the effective things that I've seen some healthcare workers do is to actually wear a picture of, of their actual face and their smile. Um, and so that's one of the ways that maybe you can bring that personality and that, that warmth to life. Um, there may be some other things that you can do signal wise with your hands, I think, to communicate that warmth. Uh, but I think that's a really valid question, Mark, is that especially when we're conveying something with feeling, you know, people are looking at our body language, they're looking at the tone of our voice to indicate that feeling. So I think we almost have to amp it up with that, that critical area being, being covered up. Rosario, your thoughts? Yeah, a couple of additions. I'm just now regretting my mask is actually far away, uh, two floors down or I would have put it on. Would you, you can do two more things. One, you can always smile with your eyes. 
So, and if you smile with your eyes, even though it's covered, people will see it. And you can get as creative as you want with the mask itself. So I have seen there is one also, I had a friend who actually print off on a mask his own smile. So that he still, you can actually still see his, his smile. I have seen also masks that come creative where they put a, a transparent piece of plastic here. So you actually can still see a see-through smile type of mask. Right. Um, or you can get, so like masks that represent you. So I have managed to find, it took me a while, but I managed to find a completely yellow mask with flowers, which for me represents also the blossoming of happiness. And I've been looking for, like, that one I still don't find, mask with sunflowers. So find also things that connect the mask to your own brand and to the message that you want to, to, to convey. But always remember that you can smile also with your eyes. Uh, and you can smile with your attitude and still with your voice. So people might not see your smile, but they can always hear your voice. Great, great suggestions, Rosaria. I think technically that's called smizing. That's a nice one. <laughs> smile, <laughs> smiling with your eyes. Uh, Dennis has got a question. He says, if you want to bring more happiness to employees and clients and customers, what do you recommend as first steps to develop a strong foundation. Um, it's all, I'll start off here before I throw it to you, Rosaria. I think, especially now when we're in a crisis, um, the ability to create a foundation of trust and to be transparent in, in what you do and, and to to be able to know that your employees know that you're operating from a place of integrity, I think is, is absolutely, um, absolutely key. So I think that's a great foundational element. I also think the, you know, going along with that trust and being able to communicate in a transparent way is that if you can be more flexible in terms of how your team members do their work, knowing that in many instances, a lot of people are working from, from home for the first time, you know, not getting so wrapped up in um, the process, but just really keeping an eye on the results and giving people more autonomy on when and how they do their work, I think is also a big step. Um, that's my, at least my initial thoughts on the on the employee side of the equation. Rosaria, your thoughts? Yeah, so I, I want to say two things. So the first thing is also has to do with what, what does your company stands for? So what is your vision? What do you stand for? What is already your brand promise? And what are the needs of your customers and employee? What do they expect from you? Um, and, I, and, and then you can link the two. I'm thinking at this point, Sana, I'm sharing again my screen because it's a good moment maybe to share sure. uh, in this example. So we also, what we also, what I did at the beginning of the crisis, I also started to look at what are companies really doing with COVID? Are they really, do, am I seeing yellow gold fish, which actually I was starting to see. And what I saw is that each and every company and some of those I already shared, for example, the one from Tony Chocolone, uh, but Qualtrics, uh, in addition to the points that I mentioned, what they also did, they started to give free access to research and to tools related to COVID. Um, Disney decided to bring Frozen 2 to Disney Plus uh, three months ahead of time. Um, so if you go, so what, they, what I did is as, as I started to see all those examples, I created the list which you can actually find on those link where you can find 33 examples of what our company is doing to um, increase happiness for customers, employees in the COVID place. And they really always match it to themselves. So these are the example I like it here. It's from Engels and Falker. The CEO decided to really connect with his employees with after hours conversation. Or again, from the client's point of view, Audible made stories for kids free. Or Zappos, again, they always say they answer any type of question. They created a specific line, anything we can help you with. And actually what they did, they helped one of the doctors, which at some point was desperate because he could not find, he could not find any oximeters to measure the oxygen of the patients. 
He just thought, you know what, I'm just going to try it and call Zappos and see what they can do for me. And they actually were able to help him find 300 of those oxytometers. So, um, like, you have to really see what fits your brand. How can you help in that specific contest? No, it's, that's, uh, that's really great, Rosaria. So, to be clear, now we have 333 examples. Is exactly. that correct? <laughs> we like number 333. <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, Here's, here's a question from Mark, and Mark was asking specifically about the Peppercom example. He said, was the comedy training improv? He says, I've worked at companies that have offered improv, but not stand-up. Not sure if these are the same things. So um, I believe it, it, was, it was actually full-on comedy training. And improv, I think, is, is just a... Ver you know, kind of a version of, of comedy, which I think has a lot of benefits um, in the workplace. Um, but I know for a fact, because uh, I ended up doing the same training uh, about nine years ago when I was thinking about going out and speaking full time. And it's actually a course, uh, I think I wanna say it's like the American Comedy Institute, because um, Steve had recommended it to me. And again, it, for me, my graduation was putting up five minutes of stand-up. And um, I, I do know that, though, from, a, from an improv perspective, especially just the simple thing of being able to be, when you're doing stuff creative and brainstorming, the simple idea of yes and mentality, of reserving judgment, and being able to truly listen to people and stay present and be able to add to ideas is just an invaluable skill. Um, and a couple of years ago, I was in Chicago and I got a chance to sit in on a, a workshop that Second City was producing, which is one of the bigger troops in the world from improv. Um, so I think it's a fantastic skill. A good friend of mine, Steve Hughes, fellow speaker, does a lot of work with attorneys to teach them the benefits of improv. Um, Rosari, any thoughts to add there? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm actually also a trained improv uh, um, person, and I did it with Boom Chicago. So maybe one tip there, if you guys look it up on, on YouTube, Boom Chicago is actually people that coming from US and they moved here to the Netherlands and they started English improv. So I took their classes years and years ago. And what they even did during COVID, they start going live on YouTube with their session. So you can actually see them. They're now available to everyone on, uh, on YouTube and you can see them. And I think I use it improv sometimes even just at the beginning of a workshop or in a meeting with, uh, with the clients. You actually don't even need to have any type of training. Yes, hand that you just mentioned, it's, it's a great example, even something that you can do very quickly. Or one of my favorite is also the one word at a time type of exercise where people alternate. I say a word and you have to say a word and we tell a story uh, each one word at a time. And I remember I used it once with the CFO of the company and the project manager to say, I want you guys to say one word at a time. You're going to convince the CEO to approve the budget for this project. And it was amazing. It actually worked out. Like they had no training whatsoever. It just worked because you activate the right side of your brain, creativity, play. And when we play and we are creative, only good things come out. So go for it. Awesome. Great. Um, Leanne Carter. Uh, so Leanne is asking if we could provide a, uh, a copy of the Listly. We use a service called Listly. List dot ly and either myself or sal or rosario will throw that link in there if you want to look at all 300 of the examples um we might wait one more minute to see if we have any more questions or comments that come in um any any last thoughts from you though rosario as we wrap things up here for yellow goldfish uh I'm going to share again the examples. So my final thought was also like, as a customer, what did it do to me? 
Uh, and as a customer, I had two examples. One was the moment that lockdown uh, stopped, I went for a massage because, you know, it's been a really, really hectic time in the house here. And what I thought, going back to the point of how do you match the needs of your customer, uh, the therapist had created a special, had found a special pillow, which uh, would help all of his female clients to lay more comfortably. It was something which I had found out from more customers, but I had never made the time to get that one. And he found that uh, as a surprise when he reopened uh, the shop. So he had this new pillow. It was an incredible, nice surprise. Or uh, similarly, also for my holidays, we are going to go in one week. Uh, it's now the fourth consecutive year that we go and have the biggest dose of happiness possible on the beach, sleeping on the beach. But those houses are really tiny and very, very close to each other. So I was very, very concerned about how are they gonna really help create, um, keep the distances. And what I found is that they had added this extra separation in between, which will actually also protect from second hand smoke or from wind. And they had created those extra wind barriers. So they really had gone above and beyond in not only uh, creating a fix for the COVID problem, but actually even solving pre pre existent needs that the customer had. Uh, so I'm really looking forward. And then from a profitability point of view, we actually decided to book an extra week. So not only we are going to go for the week in July, but I decided to book an extra week. Uh, and then my final thought is that really like, this is, I want to share a bit of that beauty and the nature of that beach. This um, beach is also where a lot of my writing of yellow boat fish has taken place. Uh, because at the end, when we are in the nature, when we are happy, we become productive. Uh, and if we as a company, but also as individual, can really help people to experience more the nature and the elements of happiness, then we all can be happier. And with this, I give back the word to you, Stan. Awesome. Hey, just shout out to, I was just looking in the chat, Whitney's got a couple of great resources if you want to find out a little bit more about um, improv. But really quickly, just... Thank you, to, um, thank you to everyone for being part of this. Here's my information and Rosaria's. Um, would love to stay connected on LinkedIn. But thank you, everyone, for being part of the Back to Black webinar series. Final thoughts, Rosaria? Thank you all. It was a pleasure to have you, and I really hope you find it useful. And indeed, just connect on LinkedIn. We'll be happy to hear.